So last week I posted a video on Medjugorje uh, about, you know, what had happened that day to me that a friend of mine, we were going to a prayer group on Wednesday evening and a friend of mine had given me a rosary from Medjugorje. And as we were coming back from that prayer group on Thursday morning after midnight, we, a few men and myself in the car, we prayed a rosary and I remember praying it with these beads on that day later that day you know my son was knocked down by a car quite seriously um and he came away from it completely unscathed so i'm not saying post hoc propter hoc argument here i'm just saying nobody has ever given me a rose a major gory rosary beads before never happened and just on the day as it happened you know these landed into my hands now another friend had gone to Medjugorje and when he was going a few weeks ago, I said, well, look, get get me a, a rosary and get it blessed by that Dominican over there. Because he, I, I remember looking at a few videos of Father Leon and he seemed very, you know, he, he seems to have done a lot of work and uh, on, on trying to make sense of what's going on there. So, you know, the friend came back and he gave me a, a nice, a nice uh, I asked him for I like a pair of rosary beads that you that will kind of won't break so um I have the I got a pair of these from from Medjugorje and with the with the Saint Benedict medal what I did notice was there was an image of our lady here this image here I don't know if people can see it uh, and I happen to have that image in our house so somebody gave me a friend of mine from the Vatican gave me a present a few years ago um, and I must have missed my mind that this is a, supposedly a, one of the images that's famous in, in Medjugorje. So this has been in hanging our house for about 15 years. And I mean, I have lots of images as a, of Our Lady. I have lots of icons. <laughs> They're all around the house. Uh, but this one is uh, was, was actually there. So I'm trying to make sense of what's happened here. You know, I'm trying to put together and make sense of you know, really what's happened. And I'm not looking to lead Catholics astray or ask you to believe anything that's not Catholic teaching. You know, I, I've seen, as I said in that video, there was lots of comments on it, you know, that it was, uh, you know, it's been proven completely false. It's demonic and God knows what, you know, people telling me, read this book and read that book and read the other book and so forth. Uh, I would just ask people to study it. You know, just study it. And on the last video, you know, Father Leon talks about what if it's fake? Well, I'm going there as the spirit of prayer. I'll pray the rosary. I'll do something very traditional. Go to confession, pray the rosary, uh, go to Eucharistic adoration. Our Lord is present in the Eucharist there. Uh, you know, it's a valid Eucharist, valid Mass. So I'm just going there in a spirit of prayer and retreat and to, to talk to friends and so forth. That's all I'm going there. I'm not saying if it's true or if it's false or making any judgment on it. As I said, this fell into my life. You know, the whole topic of Medjugorje, my friend pushing me, maybe you'll come along on pilgrimage with us. I had no interest. I had no interest going. Uh, there is a priest friend of mine. We were seminarians together. He's Italian. And as I said, he's been there 21 times. And he doesn't make any judgment on it one way or the other, but he's 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 found great peace uh, there. And so somebody w were asking, what are the fruits of Medjugorje? Well, you know, there's a lot of you, you can just look and see what's going on in the church. Um, and I and I, you know, I, I encourage people to to uh, to talk just just to talk it out on the on the apparitions itself. I, there was one apparition there. And Our Lady is asking for peace. She says it, peace three times, mir, 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 um, which happens to be the word for peace also in Russian. Obviously, the language that they speak lo locally is is similar to Russian. I mean, Our Lady of Fatima said penance, penance, penance. And Our Lady, and she's asking for peace, peace, peace. I mean, God, we look at the way the world is going. It looks like China is going to go to war with Taiwan, and who knows what restrictions the world will place on China? Then it that seems to be the the progress of it. You know, Russia is is at war in Ukraine. We could have a war in two sides in Europe and in Asia. 
uh, and you don't know how that will escalate or how far that goes. So, I mean, this could be the time that <laughs> we need mir, mir, mir. Just one thing that I was listening to Father Leon and he was talking about the experiences that the children had in the apparitions. As I said in other videos, um, you know, when I was young, 18, I asked our Lord, do you love me? Do you love me? And Christ said to me quite clearly, quite audibly, of course I love you. And I always rejected um, that experience as saying, oh, it must be my imagination. How could Christ love me? Uh, you know, I'm no saint, I'm no mystic, you know, these things don't happen to people like me. You know, it, they simply don't. This is my reasoning back in my early years in my when I was young. You know, you know it's only St. Teresa of Avila. Christ doesn't say these things to you know, sinners and people that are struggling in the faith. And, and really and truly... It goes again. That's not what the gospel is saying because Christ is asking us to be like children. You know, to be like children. Ask Christ and Our Lady for help. I've never heard Our Lady or never had an apparition of Our Lady, but I've always felt Christ very clearly. I've often had visions of Him, uh, you know, touching His Eucharistic heart, being close to Him. And I suppose Our Lady is kind of saying, Oh, if you found my son, you don't need me coming to you. You stay with him. He is my beloved son. It's like, it's like Our Lady has been, I've always had a great devotion to her, always prayed the rosary, but, you know, I've always had a beautiful devotion to Our Lady, but I've always felt Our Lady pushing me towards her son. This is my beloved son. This is the person that she most loved. Um, you know, and I, and I, I all, somebody was saying to me recently, you know, it's, it's kind of, it was providential that St. Joseph wasn't there at the crucifixion because you could just imagine St. Joseph there saying, you know, Our Lady couldn't do much, uh, as a woman, but St. Joseph, he would probably have given, <laughs> stepped in there to stop them doing something to, to Jesus, you know, but in God's providence, he was absent at the crucifixion and Our Lady was there with her son and she's kind of drawing to her to herself. And I, I, one, you know, many years ago, we were having a conversation with a guy, a friend of mine, Brian Nugent. He's um, an Irish writer. We share the same name. We come from the same region in Ireland. We're probably connected at some level because the Nugents, they all come down. But he wrote a book called Marian Apparitions in Ireland and Related, Related Phenomena. And we were just talking about how many times children had reported experiences in Ireland. And, and if you look at some of the interviews that some of the clergy have, you know, oh, no, these kids are making it up. These kids are doing this. No, they could have. Who knows? Um, that's how I would have felt. You know, that's why I said, no, would have felt as a child. You know, I, surely Christ doesn't say these things to people. These are only for those who have prayed for years and years and years. And that's the only time that Christ comes and talks to them and he gives them gifts. You know, the Padre Pios, not that I hold my any myself at all or anything like that. I'm just saying that's how I saw the, ex the experience of, of encountering Christ. And in reality, heaven isn't silent. Christ isn't silent. When we're children, when we're, you know, innocent in the sense that we, we don't expect these things, you know, Christ just pours out his love for us. He's pouring out his love for us in the Eucharist. You know, this is the sad reality. People don't, when I, when I, when I mentioned in the video why I love traditional Latin Mass, in the traditional Latin Mass, when you go to receive communion, you're kneeling there. You're, you're kind of recollected. You're kneeling in front of the priest that's, that's giving you the Eucharist. It, it, it's not hurried. It's not rushed. Uh, and, you know, the priest is saying, Corpus Domini Nostri, Custodia Anima Tua, in Vita Term. So the body will, will, will um, be, how do you say it in English? How do you translate that? Keep your soul for eternal life. May, somebody will correct me on, uh, on it. But the, 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 this beautiful Latin, Latin prayer, which in the new rite, in the new, the Novus Order, the priest says it just when he's taking communion, I think. But in the old rite, it was said for every commun everybody that's receiving communion. And I just, you just enter into that mystery of 
receiving our Lord in a, in a more reverent, in a more, you're giving yourself time, you're giving your soul time. In the new rite, and you're going up there and you're making a queue to go up for communion because we don't have altar rails anymore. We don't encourage, you know, you're, you're kind of distracted you know, looking at the person that's giving you communion and it's into your hand and then you're taking it out. Do you know what I mean? There's this whole world of distractions. You're you're looking at, whereas in the old right, if people only realise this, and it's not an ideological stance that I have, the old right just fostered Eucharistic adoration better. It just did. It, it, it did. I mean, the graces are, are there. You know, the graces are there in, you can see this in the shrine, the Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, Alabama, where Mother Angelica had in, introduced a communion only kneeling and on the tongue. They had a beautiful altar rail. They were encouraging people. I think the church, this is where the church needs to do a small examination of conscience. How can we renew the Eucharist? You know, in the old rite, you didn't have to say Amen when you received the Eucharist. Because your Amen doesn't make the Eucharist any more real. It is the body and blood, soul and divinity and love of Christ, the second person in the Holy Trinity. And you're just, you know, you're just hung. It just it just feeds a hunger in your soul. I, I mean, it's hard to explain. That is what, you know, I would love to see returned to the Latin Rite. There are small details in the Vetus Order in the Old Rite that, you know, just helped me. But anyway, you know, just going, going back here. I just be, we need to be children. We need to be children in God's arms. Just be children, you know. As I said, you know, Christ said me to me when I was a child, of course I love you. Why wouldn't Christ love you? And we, we kind of reject it. And, and then through your life, I'm there in the boat and Christ is on the water and so Christ is saying, Robert, are you coming to me? And I'm saying, Christ, please don't make me walk in that water. You know, I don't have that faith. And it's really when it comes to the realisation you know, you have to have the faith to walk in water and to go towards Christ, you know. Um, and there was a poem that, that really that really brought home that experience to me many years ago. It's 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 um, Francis Thompson, the Hound of Heaven. And I was just it's a be- it's a poem that I just, you know, you love it so much. And that's the Christ that, you know, that, that I experienced all of my, my life. That Hound of Heaven, he's always there. Uh, Christ never abandons us. He hasn't abandoned our church in this moment in crisis. You know, whatever stuff is going on, this synodal process where Christ is completely absent. He's been forgotten. The Eucharist, Eucharistic renewal, encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. It's not even up there at number one as the most important in the church. What we have understood, what we have in place as the most important in the synodal process in Ireland is our preferences and our stuff and this is you know but i i don't know where it's going the church will have to decide i just thought i'd read the hound of heaven if you haven't heard this poem it's quite beautiful and it kind of even the title itself the hound of heaven you know says it all about the poem Uh, i fled him down the nights and down the days i fled him down the arches of the years I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter and visited hopes, I sped and shot, participated. Adown titanic looms and chasmed fears. From those strong feet that followed, followed after. But wish, unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed and majestic instancy, they beat. And a voice beat. More instant than the feet, all things betray thee who betrayest me. Um, you know, it, I, I'll read more of that poem. It, I do encourage people to go through it. And that's, you know, when you're, when you're reflecting back, you know, the encounter of Christ and, and, and running away from that because you're, you're not, you know, you're not sure. And then. You know, Christ reveals himself slowly and slowly and he's kind of that hound from heaven coming back to us. Uh, You know, Christ isn't absent in his church. Christ isn't absent in his church. And anything I'm saying in this video, you know, let the church, if somebody comes back saying what you're saying is is crazy, Robert, you've got it wrong. That's not how how the church works. That's not how uh, experience of Christ is. 
let the church decide. I have no, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm willing to stand corrected. I can only work on my own experiences. We have to be like children. We have to teach the world the beauty of Catholicism, the encounter with Christ in the Eucharist, the God that is pulling us back, the God that is so present that his love is so incredible. And, uh, you know, that, that's really interesting. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard sometimes because, you know, in the church we see good and we see evil. You know, the, the reality of evil is there. The reality of abuse and abuse of power and abuse of faith is there. I mean, I was a legionary of Christ. Uh, one of the biggest phenomenons uh, in the last 50 years in the church on every level. You know, we were held up there. We were in Rome. We were, you know, and the founder wasn't who he, the church thought. And, you know, the, the shock waves that resulted from that caused a lot of people to lose their faith, lose their faith in the church, lose their faith in Christ, lose their faith in the Eucharist. And so my experience of Christ goes back before that. You know, I'm drawing from my childhood, really. You know, that raw encounter with Christ. Christ has given me everything I've ever asked. He is so amazing. Um, and that's why, I, you know, I do ask the church to renew the Eucharist. And in this time, in this moment in time, I ask the church to talk to the amazing groups of Catholics in the church who love traditional Latin Mass. The, um, they are simply outstanding, you know, and people have seen my video on with John Salsa um, on the Society of St. Pius X in the future. And, and what they haven't seen is my pain at the amazing Catholics that are there, that the society has. Amazing, outstanding in so many ways that love the faith. We need to come together as one church and to love our Lord, uh, you know, and not be afraid to look at tradition and but not be afraid to also look at what Christ is doing in his church today. You know, the, the Christ is walking here today. He's moving souls. And it, it's, it's simply incredible to see what Christ is doing. It's, you know, I'm just I'm just bowled away. I'm just bowled away. And my, and my friends will say this because we talk a lot about the faith uh, or, and what's happening, you know. The, 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 it's just how he's transforming hearts and souls, how he's trans transforming his church. It's, it's, and he's, and he's doing it in places that people don't expect, in souls, in places. He's walking, he's working. Our Lady is there in, in, in so many places that we, do, we don't expect. And maybe, you know, Medjugorje could be one of those places. As I said, let the church decide. Let the church decide. This is important to remain in the church. It's important to remain there because as time progresses, you know, the, the, our Lord and the Holy Spirit will work there. And and, and the truth, you know, the, the time is the great revealer of truth. And we have to let uh, that go. And, and And as I said, for those of you who despair and who are anxious and sad, especially traditional Catholics who I love. I mean, I mean, it's a sad time. You know, the, I'm seeing communities, parishes that spent hundreds of thousands renewing and 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 redecorating their church. And and, uh, you know, and for their bishop to say now the money you've spent over the last 10 to 15 years, the money you've spent with permission of the church. The mass that you had with permission of the church will actually we're going to take that away from you now. You know, it's quite incredible that we've had one pope saying, yes, it's perfectly fine to do this. It's fine if you're a community to promote this and to do this. And they've gone ahead. They've given money. They've they've redecorated their beautiful churches. And then we see it now. Well, actually, this church that that you've redecorated and the altar that you've redecorated and all this, this money, this, well, we're actually taking that away and you, you can't worship in that form. Let people worship Christ in the form, in, the, in that beautiful silence, reverence, if that's what they want, you know. I think we, we should be able to have peace between the Vetus and the Novus Ordo. One, one should be a flow, it should continue from one to the other. Um, so, you know, as I said, you know, I love my faith. 
I love this encounter with Christ. I think, you know, it's it's quite amazing. And the older I've get, the, the more I realize uh, it's really Christ that that has given me the most peace in my life. You know, the, 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 the nearer I am to the Eucharist, the more you take advantage of sanctifying grace, the more you, you know, take advantage of confession and Eucharist. Uh, I just think, you know, it, it's it's quite amazing. But I'm so impressed with the people that I know that are doing amazing work. You know, simple boots on the ground, helping people that are, you know, in difficult times. This is what Christ wants. This is the evangelization that he wants in his church. Boots on the ground, mission, you know, reaching out to souls that need help, being there to accompany them, to walk with them. It's quite, a, it's quite amazing. You know, let's not close ourselves. Be so narrow-minded that uh, we think that the only experience of Christ is what we think is there. You know, Christ works in ways we can never expect. Let him out in his church. Let him walk where he wants. Encourage each other. Walk with, with, with each other. But I will say, you know, those of you who comment to my videos and, you know, you're all you're very skeptical of Medjugorje and you're I mean, I'm skeptical of many things. You know, I'm I'm kind of once bitten, twice shy and I'm skeptical of so much in the church, but I'm not skeptical of Christ. I'm not skeptical of that encounter with Christ. You know, why wouldn't Christ say he loved me? Why wouldn't he show me himself to me? Why wouldn't he want me to know his love? You know, if he's saying it, if he's saying it here, why isn't, if he says it here, why wouldn't he say it in my heart? Do you know what I mean? Am I getting it wrong? This isn't a stale, um, ancient text. You know, Christ is alive. He's living, he's walking, he's, he's moving hearts, he's moving souls. You know, and when it comes to faith formation, faith formation isn't just a lecture in a classroom it's prayer it's getting up and meeting people praying with them talking to them going to somebody who needs help saying what can i do for you today you know you're not feeling good well maybe let's sit down and have a coffee let's go for a meal that's how you teach the faith is 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 to is to live it and we're, we are we're desperately not doing that to our children in ireland it's it's so sad Anyway, look, um, as I said, I've put together now the, a series of videos that, that Father Leon has done for Tecton Ministries. Um, uh, Father Leon said it was OK, but um, I haven't. Uh, I'm going to acknowledge Tecton Ministries. They're not asking me to promote them or anything like that. It's it's uh, I'm just saying it's it's an, it's great videos that they've done. So if you're if you're uh, if you know them or if you can avail of their pilgrimages, please do give them a like and share. Go to their YouTube channel. They have some great videos. There's actually another video there on the YouTube channel, a father, a, a, a longer video um by uh with father leon you know introduction to the five stones and you'll you'll see it there so i do i do recommend that you that you go to the youtube channel you can see a lot more stuff do your own investigation pray on it um you know just 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 see you know where it is in the church you know what you know have pray on it that at the end of the day the church will decide and i do encourage people to know your faith, because even if this all turned out to be, this whole phenomenon turned out to be fake and false, it should, we, our faith is in Christ, it's in the Eucharist, it's in Our Lady. You know, these things come and go, but our faith is in Christ, is in Christ and in Our Lady. And I, I just don't think they're silent in this moment in time in the church. They are talking, they are moving. Christ is certainly doing that. You know, it's it's quite incredible to see what's happening. Of course, Christ loves you. Why wouldn't he? That's how I've seen him. That's how I felt him. You know, and he is so real. He is so, I don't know, how can, how can I say this anymore? But look, pray for the church. Pray for priests and bishops, for the Pope, for unity. And, uh, you know, if you're a traditional Catholic, I know how... I, I feel for you. And if you're somebody who goes to the Society of St. Pius X, I, I know how difficult it is. 
I do, I do. You know, I cannot say, I cannot say. It's sad that the church can't see so many great Catholics that are there. It's, you know, that's the painful thing. They are the most amazing Catholics you could meet. Simply are. I'll call out priests in Ireland, Father Leo Boyle, Father Patrick Kimball, um, Father Ben. So, you know, outstanding priests that love their faith. Their communities love their faith. It's a hard time in the church. Um, and, you know, it, it must be so sad for them to see uh, what has happened to Catholicism in Ireland. Because they love their faith. This is the, the sad thing. But we need... <laughs> we need them now we need uh, uh, tradition we need something uh, to challenge a generation and that's what I'm saying get all the tools out of the bag guys you know work well, renew the faith renew what is beautiful some of us will like the silence of a traditional Latin mass others will like charismatic more charismatic what is wrong with the, the, the allowing Christ to speak where he wants to speak you know this is what I'm I'm really calling I'm really calling people to talk to each other you know I, I ask Catholics to go to traditional Latin Mass for the simple reason experience the silence and the beauty and the mystery and the wonder of what previous generations experienced in a sign of wonderment not of uh, not of protest experience that it seems like it'll be taken away, like it's what we've seen in Chicago. Well, before priests and cardinals and bishops who were born during the crazy times, before they decide to take what they were nourished with. you know, It's amazing when you see Pope Francis, all of these cardinals that are making these decisions, most of them were nourished by that as children. And they're saying that now they've come to another generation. Now, we don't want you to experience what we experienced as sacred. Guys, it doesn't make sense. Come on, come on. There is room. This 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 beautiful church is big. You know, we wouldn't we wouldn't denigrate or destroy or remove our, a beautiful Greek Catholic uh, divine service. Said ad orientum very reverently with lots of vestments, with the beautiful I icons. You know, we res the church would respect that. Well, you know, please. I know I'm praying. So anyway, look. Long, longer video today um but I, I i do think it's important that we we ne we we uh, study what's going on in Medjugorje now and with a little bit of honesty and we see where it's going as i said this all fell into my lap and people are laughing at me the friends that I know me that they're laughing at me saying robert you've said you're never going to Medjugorje you weren't interested in and, yeah, and i wasn't i didn't think i'd bother you know Things happen. Things happen. So uh, I do think just let, 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 let's let pray and let's hope that there is some coming together. Uh, some, you know, the faith will renew it, but it'll be it has to be done by souls who are convinced of their of their encounter with Christ. And, you know, you can't buy that. You can't buy faith renewal. It has to come from the heart. Uh, and that's what will happen in the church anyway look pray for the church and as i said be kind be charitable don't knock other people down don't you know either side either side you know help them show them blog about your faith if you're uh if you're if you go to traditional latin mass blog about it show how beautiful it is you know we've seen the mass of the ages documentary why aren't we seeing dozens hundreds of other uh, documentaries and films and blogs about your faith community your love for the faith put it out there you know if there was a thousand different blogs and vlogs and uh, videos on traditional latin mass maybe people would say and on the other side do the same if you love novus ordo and you've been nourished by it and you've it's helped you and that's the encounter with christ for example you're a korean catholic because i know koreans Catholics, it has helped that church immensely. You know, um, having the 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 liturgy in the local language, it's grown the faith. It simply has. There's no other way to say it. You know, blog about it. Show how beautiful it is. Show how it's helped. You know, I think there. I think the church 
<laughs> we just need to give leadership in this in this moment in time in the church and we need all the tools we need we need all these tools at the moment to evangelize we need traditional latin mass to evangelize we you know we need all these tools if the novus ordo is the liturgy of the second vatican council as you know i would argue that some of it isn't you know the way it's implemented but it, if it is then why aren't we referencing sacrosanctum concilium more to try and you know it, it, you, the fruits don't seem to be working as as expected i don't know i'm just asking the questions anyway god bless take care and you know i give you this video and uh you know please let, let me know in your comments if you want me to to try and do anything else on this but uh, i'm just giving you my thoughts on it anyway god bless take care bye bye As I said, the videos that I've clipped together, all of that playlist, um, they come from a ministry in the church, Tecton Ministries, Encounter Christ and a Catholic Pilgrimage. I do encourage you to go on pilgrimages. I do encourage you. I really do. Um, and they're based in America. But if you go to the website, Tecton Ministries, they haven't asked me to promote their website, but I just think their work is so good. Um, it's great to see these groups uh, doing it. Now, their uh, pilgrimage is obviously to Medjugorje. They're, they're pricing it from an American point of view. And the biggest cost for Americans to travel is the, is the, is the airplane, is the air cost. Uh, for us Europeans, it's, it's a lot cheaper thank be, thankfully so uh, just go to their website uh, tecton ministries uh, t-e-k-t-o-n ministries and you can just see some of the work that they're doing i do encourage you to to go there um and just to experience it from your for yourself um anyway that's uh you know that's the the group that put together these uh, short videos that i'm that i've just put together in one video here um i asked father leon if i could do it and uh just just to let you know okay god bless take care bye bye one objection is why should i even pay attention to private revelation people say we don't need private revelation when they say this, of course, you know, there are two categories of revelation uh, that are obvious to us in the church. There's public revelation and private revelation. Public revelation, now I, I think the words are slightly unhelpful, the names, public and private, because it sounds like out in the open and not out in the open. So it's slightly misleading. It's a bit of a red herring. Public revelation has nothing to do with it being out in the open. It's got to do with the revelation of Christ given to the apostles. Uh, through the church, down through the ages, through sacred tradition and scripture, coming down to us. So the sacred deposit of faith, as Vatican II would call it, um, which lives in the church and comes to us from Christ uh, through his apostles. Okay, So that's public revelation. It's what we have to believe to be Catholic. Private revelation, then, is any other apparition of Jesus or Mary or the saints or angels to any individual. Now, it could happen in a private room, it could happen out in public in front of a million people. That does not make it public. It remains private revelation, okay? And private revelation cannot teach us anything new about the faith. It cannot add to our faith, cannot subtract from our faith. So in this sense, it is true that we are not obliged to believe it. But if a private revelation is actually authentic, then we can say it's from God and we would probably do well to heed it. And all private revelation can do, if it's authentic, is tell us what to do for our time. So, for example, the, the revelations of the Sacred Heart to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque arose at a time when the heresy of Jansenism was rife. And Jansenism really is like the um, idea that we are totally unworthy of God. And nothing we do, uh, which, I mean, of course we're unworthy of God, but almost like, almost like God barely tolerates us. 
um, it's a very negative spirituality. To combat that, our Lord himself revealed his sacred heart. Now, we already knew right from the beginning that the heart of Jesus is the heart of a divine person. The human heart of Jesus belongs to a divine person who loves us. Who loves us so much, he even allows his heart to be pierced in death to show us, you know, there's nothing he, he wouldn't allow to happen to him just for our salvation. And it's to breed confidence in God's love for us. Okay, so it's like an antidote to Jansenism. Now, and then, of course, in our own time, um, the devotion to the, uh, to the Divine Mercy, the revelations to St. Faustina Kowalska, they are again, for our own time, to encourage people to trust in God's mercy for us, also, but also warning us that these are the times of mercy because a time of justice is coming. You know, it's not just mercy for everyone, just like that. It's mercy, but mercy depends on repentance, conversion of life. And God is calling us to that. Okay, so revelations tell us what to do for our time. Marian apparitions, especially in the last couple of centuries, seem to tell us what to do for our time with Lourdes and Fatima. The messages are penance, conversion. And Medjugorje is no different, I think, in that respect. It is about penance and conversion, conversion of life, um, living our life for God and not just paying lip service. So this objection, you know, saying, well, you know, private revelation is not compulsory, is not necessary. Yes, strictly speaking, it's true. But if it is from God, then it's telling us what to do for our time. You know, it's, it's almost like you could say, um, well, lots of things are not necessary. Poetry is not necessary. But if you were like that, I think you'd be poorer for it. You know, if you had no poetry in your soul, you never really experience great joys or really empathize with sorrows. You'd never really see beauty in the world around you. Or, or you'd see it, but be completely unable to appreciate it or articulate it. And I think it would be a loss to us if we ignored the private revelation that Holy Mother Church says is worthy of belief. Okay, even if Holy Mother Church doesn't compel us to believe it, it she says it's worthy of belief, I think we ought to. You know, we ought to listen to our mother. People object, why should I follow as yet unapproved messages or apparitions? So let's see if this is true. If we think about the examples of Lourdes and Fatima. Now Lourdes, the phenomenon began in 1858. It was approved four years later in 1862. And the bishop there in his approval of it said, the apparitions are supernatural and divine and that by consequence what Bernadette saw was the most blessed virgin. Our convictions are based on the testimony of Bernadette, but above all on the things that have happened, things which can have nothing other than divine intervention, such as the conversion of sinners, miraculous cures, and the enormous crowds of the faithful who come spontaneously to the grotto, who have not ceased to come ever since the first appearances, and whose purpose is to ask for blessings or to give thanks for those already received. So there you go. With Lourdes, one of the reasons it's approved is the people coming there when it was not yet approved. Okay, And if we look at Fatima, we find something similar. The bishop there declared when he approved it, he said that the children's visions are worthy of belief and he permitted devotion to Our Lady of Fatima and his reasons for this approval include the vast numbers of witnesses to the solar miracle, conversions, healings, and, quote, multitudes in their thousands coming from the four corners of the land who make their way en masse to Fatima, close quote. So there he actually, he mentions the, the solar miracle, people actually watching it when it was unapproved, and also the people coming to Fatima when it was unapproved, as yet unapproved. So this is actually part of the process Holy Mother Church uses to approve an apparition. So the objection that you can't go to somewhere unapproved, we see is clearly 
not true. Um, and also it's, it's unhelpful because the church is looking to see are people going there and what's happening in their lives to be able to discern where Medjugorje is coming from. Is it really of supernatural origin or not? And following on from that objection, people say, hasn't the bishop condemned, the local bishop condemned Medjugorje? So how could we go there? Bishop Zhanich condemned it, and then the authority was taken away from him and given to the Yugoslav Bishops' Conference. And then later his successor, Bishop Peric, also expressed uh, his opposition to the phenomena of Medjugorje. Now, this... Um, I suppose caused confusion among people because you know the bishops against it. Are we allowed to go there? This you know probably sounds bad. If we if we go there, are we disobeying the local bishop, etc. So the Vatican clarified this in response to a query, and this is a letter from Archbishop then Archbishop now Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone, and he explains on the basis of the investigation made at Zadar. So far, it cannot be affirmed that one is dealing with supernatural apparitions and revelations, i.e. non constat de supernaturalitate, the middle category. And then the bishop went on to say, What Bishop Perich said in his letter of 2nd October 1997 to the Secretary General of Famille Chrétienne, declaring, quote, My conviction and my position is not only non constat de supernaturalitate, but likewise constat de non-supernaturalitate of the apparitions or revelations in Medjugorje, close quote, should be considered the expression of the personal conviction of the Bishop of Mostar, which he has the right to express as ordinary of the place, but which is and remains his personal opinion. Okay, so that's what Rome had to say about this. It said the Bishop's objection remained his personal opinion that the duty and the competence to judge Medjugorje had then gone to the Bishop's Conference of Bosnia and Herzegovina, of which he was a member, but with at least two other bishops. The objection that the Bishop objects to it, we can see Rome herself intervened to clarify that that was not a valid objection to Medjugorje. Another objection is, hasn't the church already condemned Medjugorje? So how could we even go there or listen to it? Now, when we look at how the church deals with um, an alleged apparition, there are three judgments Holy Mother Church can make. The first category is constat de supernaturalitate, meaning this is established as supernatural. So that's confirming that this place is worthy of belief. Okay. The second category is non constat de supernaturalitate. It is not established as supernatural, which kind of signals doubt about this. You know, it's not established. Uh, it could be supernatural, it could not be, but we're not entirely sure just yet. Okay. And then there's a third category, which is constat de non supernaturalitate, it is established as non-supernatural. Now, this is complete rejection. This is definitely not from God. This is not supernatural. It would be a rejection. So you have approval and rejection, and in between you have, could be, we're not sure. So Medjugorje belongs to the middle category, you know, because yeah, it is true the local bishop there uh, objected to Medjugorje. Uh, bishop Zhanich, at that time he was the bishop of Mosta. And uh, although he initially said Medjugorje is supernatural and he believed it, etc., you know, initially that was what he said, and then later he changed his mind. Then the Holy Mother Church intervened and took away the responsibility for uh, judging Medjugorje in these terms from the local bishop and gave it to all the bishops of Yugoslavia, the country where Medjugorje was in at that time. So it's the Bishops' Conference of Yugoslavia who met in Zadar. It's a coastal town on the Dalmatian coast. 
1991, and they chose the middle ground, that this is not established as supernatural, meaning that they don't know. If they're not approving it, they're not rejecting it. Now, I want to give you a little quote from Pope Benedict about private revelation, just to explain, because he explains so beautifully. He says, Church approval of a private revelation essentially means that its message contains nothing contrary to faith and morals. It can be a valuable aid for better understanding and living the gospel at a certain time. Consequently, it should not be treated lightly. It is a help which is proffered, but its use is not obligatory. So he says, first of all, you know, when ch the church approval of an apparition is just basically saying there's nothing in it against our faith and morals. Fine. It's not saying we approve of it 100% and you've got to uh, implement this in your life. No, it, Holy Mother Church is not saying that. But at the same time, he says it should not be treated lightly. It's a help that's offered, but it is not oblig obligatory. So, you know, it, I don't know, it's a bit like you're in the sea, uh, splashing around, someone throws you a life ring or a boy or whatever. Um, it's not obligatory to cling on to it, but if the seas are rough, maybe you'd be better off taking it. You know, it's, it's a help in this sense. Sometimes people object that Medjugorje has gone on for too long. The duration of the apparitions is the objection. Now, this makes me kind of smile because I think, well, you know, how long is too long? You know, it's a bit like the question, how long is a piece of string? Uh, what would people be happy with? <laughs> I don't think it's up to us to decide how long an apparition could be or should be. But let's just look at history. Let's look at other apparitions and see their duration. Okay, some apparitions began and ended in the same year, such as Guadalupe, La Salette, Lourdes, and Nock. Some were spread over years. Quibejo, eight years. Amsterdam and Betania, 14 years. San Nicolas in um, Argentina, 35, 36 years, currently ongoing. Los in France, 54 years. Fatima, one year, but then the apparitions continued to Sister Lucia for another 88 years until she died. So how long is too long? I think the length that, an, that the apparitions are spread over, that's not really a good objection. Sometimes people object that Medjugorje has gone on for so long and it's still not yet approved. So the delay of approval is what they object to. Again, let's look at other apparition sites and see what's going on with them. So the average interval time for approval I've worked out is 64.8 years. So Medjugorje is what, 38 years currently? That still gives us 26 years before we're even average. Okay, but then really let's look at other places. I mean, the record breakers are Champion in Wisconsin, 151 years before approval. Shiluva in Lithuania, 167 years before it was approved. Uh, dear, this gets harder to pronounce. This is in Poland. Lezhaiksk, 174 years. And Los in France, L-A-U-S, 344 years before approval. So these are the kind of record breakers. So a kind of delay before approval also does not, does not uh, argue against the authenticity of an alleged apparition site. Okay. Sometimes people object and say, well, the Blessed Virgin Mary does not make appointments because in Medjugorje, she appears at certain fixed times and dates prearranged, and they hold this as an objection against the authenticity of Medjugorje. Well, I think it's quite practical because if she wants to appear to you, you have to make sure that you're there and not elsewhere, you know, like gone to your doctor's appointment or gone bowling or something. 
like what Juan Diego, especially, you know, she says, come back, same time, same place. And he, he wants to go back, but his uncle is sick. So the next day, he actually takes a detour. He tries to avoid her. And then she comes down the mountain and catches him and says, where are you going? <laughs> you know? So when she says, come and meet me at this time and place, she's quite serious. And we ought to take that seriously. Lord, she says, will you do me the great grace of coming here for 15 days? So she makes an appointment. And Fatima, she says, come back here for six months on the 13th of every month. So from all this, we see that the Mother of God is perfectly capable of making appointments and appearing at a predetermined place and time of her choosing. So that doesn't sound like a, a valid objection to say, well, no, the Mother of God doesn't do that. Well, we've seen that she does. Yet another objection is that the messages of Medjugorje are too repetitive, that Our Lady is repeating herself over and over again. Okay, now this is, I think this is fairly a straightforward objection to answer. We just have to think about every mother in the land, you know, how often do they tell their kids to come down for dinner or clean their rooms, wipe their feet, do their homework? Because this objection is saying that if they repeat themselves, they're clearly fake. You know, that doesn't make any sense. If they have to repeat themselves, their children are bad children, disobedient children, unwilling to listen. If Our Lady has to repeat herself in Medjugorje, then the same is true of us. We are bad children, unwilling to listen, disobedient, stubborn. People sometimes object to the lives of the visionaries, as though all the visionaries should have become priests or nuns and pursued a religious vocation. And the fact that they did not in Medjugorje is somehow counted against them and held against them. Now here I think there's a confusion between being a visionary and with actual sanctity. You know, to be a visionary is not because they deserve it. It's a grace, um, freely given. A visionary ought to become a saint, just like all of us ought to become saints. But we shouldn't assume that a visionary is necessarily a saint. Saint Bernadette really is quite exceptional. You know, she showed a lot of prudence, um, wisdom, care. The other thing is, we also, I said visionaries are not necessarily saints. We have to leave that space, you know. Again, St. Bernadette was lucky because she did not want to remain in Lourdes. She wanted to escape, escape the crowds. And also the bishop and um, her family and the, other, and the local pastor all had the wisdom to say, we need to move her out of Lourdes before she becomes a freak show. Okay, so she was lucky to escape. It was sad for her because she could never see Lourdes again. You know, her last apparition, because the, the apparitions began in March, February, March. And her last apparition is one that few people know about. It happened in July that year, where she, the crowds were already so big, she was already a celebrity. And so she had to sneak in on the other side of the Gav, the river. And she looked at the grotto and Our Lady appeared. And they were there, you know, like like 100, 200 yards apart and they just smiled at each other and bowed. That was the last apparition she had because she couldn't go up to the grotto because of the crowds. It's, it's sad, it's poignant, but it kind of shows what happens, what could happen to a visionary. Now, I want to look at one particular apparition, La Salette in France, which happened just before Lourdes, where such wisdom did not apply the mission of the shepherds is ended. The shepherds are the children, Melanie and Maxima. That of the church begins. They can move away, become dispersed in the world, even unfaithful to the great grace received. But the apparition of Mary will not thereby be shaken, for it is certain and nothing coming after can act against it. And notice his wisdom. 
you know, he says the apparitions are real, it's a great grace, and the, the visionaries might even be unfaithful afterwards, but that does not negate the reality of La Salette. And it's kind of prophetic he said that, because the two visionaries lived slightly chaotic lives. It's not their fault, I don't think. They were the first celebrity visionaries that we really know of, because people hounded them and chased them, um, elevated them to this great status. They, they didn't want it, but it had its effect. So what happened is that Melanie, the girl, she joined four different orders, religious orders, and she left all of them. She was dispensed from her vows, and then she died uh, in a private house in Naples uh, with a friend. And that's how her life came to an end. The boy, Maxima, is an even sadder story because he flunked out of high school. He tried to become a doctor that failed. He joined the army temporarily, then he was dismissed from that. He tried to train as a pharmacist, that didn't work out. And then he lent his name to a fellow who made liquor, you know, kind of cashing in on the visionary fame. And this guy made a lot of money with the liquor, but cheated Maxima. And Maxima himself is supposed to have died penniless, alcoholic. Uh, he died in a state of grace, you know, having received the last sacraments, but he was penniless and alcoholic. Like, really what the world would look at and say, this is a failure. This is not exactly how you expect visionaries to end up, but this is what happened to the two of them, because they are hounded and uh, treated like celebrities. So we have to remember visionaries are human beings. They're not saints. They're called to be saints, just like we are. We have to leave them alone. Another objection about Medjugorje is uh, an incident in the life of Miriana, the, one of the visionaries. She had a neighbor called Pasha, who was a Muslim, an older woman. And there was allegedly a message where Our Lady said something like, uh, Pasha has, is the, and there are different versions quoted on the internet that Pasha is the holiest among all of you or um, is the most devout, that's the one I've most commonly come across, is the most devout person among you or is an example of devotedness. Now, I remember Talking to Mariana, she says she doesn't remember saying something like that, but she does remember uh, noting Pasha's strong faith. Okay, now bear in mind Pasha is a Muslim. So this is from Mariana's book where she says on page 22, An older Muslim woman named Pasha lived alone in the apartment below ours. She did not have any family nearby, so my parents treated her like she was part of ours. If something broke in her apartment, my father fixed it. And when we invited Pasha over for dinner, my mom prepared the meal according to Islamic law. The food most beloved to God, Pasha would say, is food shared among many people. Pasha became quite fond of me and she started to call me Mala Plavusha, or little blonde thing. Sometimes when I was outside in the park, she opened a window and shouted, My little blonde, will you go buy me some bread? Even if I had to leave my friends, I never said no. Buying things for Pasha gave me the opportunity to chat with her. Although she probably could have gone shopping herself, I think she enjoyed the company. And with Grandma Yela being so far away, she became like my surrogate grandmother. Pasha loved to speak about God and she admired our Catholic beliefs. Hold on to your faith, she used to tell me. And when you get married, choose someone who shares your beliefs. It's best for your children. So here we have a lovely little anecdote about Pasha. Basically a family friend, more or less, treated like a surrogate grandmother by Miriana's family. And here Miriana says that Pasha had a strong faith and also kind of encouraged Miriana in her Catholic faith. Didn't ask her to convert, didn't try and make her Muslim or anything like that. So there's allegedly a message where our Lady is supposed to have remarked upon Pasha's strong faith and encouraged them to have such a faith. Well, what's wrong with that? I think, you know, she's not saying be a Muslim. 
She's saying, be strong in your Catholic faith. And in fact, Pasha says, be strong in your Catholic faith. So that's a good example for all of us to listen to and heed. Another objection is that Medjugorje has become too commercialized, that there are too many restaurants and shops in Medjugorje. Now, first of all, I want to know why is this an objection to the authenticity of the apparitions? Um, and I think people are getting a bit confused when they use this as an objection, because remember that quote from the Bishop of Grenoble says, whatever happens after does not negate the initial authenticity of the phenomenon. So, is Medjugorje too commercialized? First of all, I think people who object to Medjugorje being too commercialized have probably never been to Lourdes. I know Lourdes has a head start on Medjugorje, at least, at least 100 years, 130 years head start on Medjugorje. So things are far more developed in Lourdes. The hotels are huge, huge. There are lots of restaurants, some really fancy restaurants, lots of bars and pubs. Uh, even a cinema, all kinds of things are going on in Lourdes. Now, I've been to Lourdes many, many times. And what is true is that if you allow it, you can completely bypass the spiritual aspects of Lourdes. And just, it would be just like a holiday in the south of France. And sadly, I think some people do treat it that way. And I object to that. But really, that's up to us. We have to go to Lourdes with the proper spirit and try and enter into the spirit of being a pilgrim. And if we do, then we will experience Lourdes. And the same applies to Medjugorje. I think, you, yes, it's possible you could come to Medjugorje and completely bypass all the graces God is giving there. But that's up to you. Um, if you don't like the commercialization, don't shop. <laughs> don't go into the shops. If you don't like the restaurants, don't go there. Do not go there. In fact, yeah, I'm telling you, Honestly, especially the shops on a Sunday, if you, don't, if you disapprove of Sunday trading, and I do, do not go, do not do any shopping on a Sunday there at all. Let them all close. Let them all respect the Lord's Day uh, and, and shut and keep it as a holy day. Fine. As for the restaurants, I think restaurant is a fancy term for what we have in Medjugorje. They're more like slightly jazzed up cafes. Um, but, yeah, not, not, none of them are terribly fancy. In fact, when people come, they always say, oh, it's so cheap, everything is so cheap. People have to eat. So there are places that cater for that. Uh, but there's, there's not that many. I, I think it is a shame when a pilgrimage site develops too much. I think it would be better always in all of these places if the bishops took charge, allowed a certain development and, you know, and said, please keep the simplicity of the place or, you know, put these other things further away. They are distractions. I don't like them. I don't think they should be in Lourdes or Fatima or Medjugorje or any other shrine. There's one shrine that I know of, which is quite simple, Walsingham in England. Um, it's a thousand year old shrine. It's in the middle of nowhere. And it is really, really, really undeveloped. Um, especially if you go there in winter, you have to like drive at least 20 miles if you want to get lunch because nothing is open in the village. So that has kept its character. <laughs> but also that was aided by the Protestants coming and destroying everything there 500 years ago. So <laughs> that kept it very simple. <laughs> okay. There's a kind of expectation that visionaries should become nuns or priests or monks and pursue a religious vocation. And even if they don't do that, uh, even if people don't expect that, they still think, well, you know, if you're a visionary, you should more or less live like a hermit or live as a great saint, etc. Saint Bernadette really is quite exceptional. You know, she showed a lot of prudence, um, wisdom, care 
For example, her little brother showed some pilgrims the way to the grotto. And uh, I think it was her brother, Pierre. And they gave him a nice big silver coin. And he was so pleased with himself. He came back home and showed the whole family, look what I got you know, from the pilgrims. And Saint Bernadette, when she saw that, she slapped him. And she said, go back now and give it back. We must not take money from the pilgrims. Okay. And then later, when she was in the convent at Nevers, she heard that her sister, Tony Antoinette, had opened a shop and was selling rosaries. And she wrote to her very angrily and said, shut that down now and stop. And uh, Tony, to her credit, wrote back equally vehemently and said, look, I need to live. I, we have no other means of making money. And then Bernadette said, okay, but make sure you never become rich. Okay. But even in Bernadette's time, people said nasty things about the apparitions and Bernadette's family. They said, oh, look, you know, the Subiru, they used to live in the Kasho, the dungeon. And now they live in a fairly decent place. And, you know, the father's got a job. The mother doesn't have to work so hard anymore. You know, this is all a bit suspicious. This is a bit too convenient. Okay, they said that about Bernadette. They said that about the kids at Fatima. Because the place of the apparition was on land owned by the uncle which was then sold to the church. The family made quite a bit of money out of it. They rebuilt the house. They lived a more comfortable life after the apparitions. Uh, I mean, the family lived a more comfortable life. Okay, The two kids, Francisco and Jacinta, suffered horribly and died soon after. And, and Lucia then had to go off to the convent. But the rest of the family, they lived fairly comfortably. They were, they were really poor before the apparitions, but after the apparitions, you know, it's kind of suspicious, you could say. You know, I, I'm not suspicious, okay? I'm just saying people were suspicious and said nasty things about them. So when people say the same sort of thing about the visionaries in Medjugorje, I'm not surprised. They've done it before. They'll do it again. This is human nature. I want to address the fact that the visionaries did not become religious. This, I call it a Vozu syndrome. This is my own thing that I made up, okay? And it's called Vozu, named after uh, St. Bernadette's novice mistress, who later became Mother Superior, Marie-Thérèse Vozu, because she said that she saw herself as being far more worthy than Bernadette to receive an apparition. In her own words, I quote, if the Holy Virgin wanted to appear somewhere on earth, why would she choose a common illiterate peasant instead of some virtuous and well-instructed nun? She meant herself, I think. Um, and I think a lot of people suffer from this. They look, they see the visionaries, uh, and they judge them to be unworthy. And they are unworthy, of course. And they think, well, you know, I'm better than that. But... How come the Blessed Mother hasn't appeared to me? Well, we don't know. We don't know who God chooses to send Our Lady to. It's not up to us to decide. Okay? Another objection to Medjugorje is based on some of the alleged messages of Medjugorje. Uh, as though some of them might be contrary to our faith. For example, there's an early message where I think the context was a little Serbian Orthodox boy was cured. And apparently, I think a Franciscan priest expressed surprise at this. Now, you have to understand, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, there are you know, a good number of ethnicities there are Slovenes, Croats, Serbs, uh, Muslims who are now called Bosniaks. Okay, that was their ethnicity. Um, Montenegrins and Macedonians. At least six. They're all closely related to each other. And in fact, uh, Bosni Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs are really, really closely related to each other. The language is more or less the same. Um, and uh, the people have so much in common. Okay? But they do think of themselves as different. 
And in the former Yugoslavia and in the, the countries that now exist, which represent the former Yugoslavia, so the countries of Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia, etc. Um, religion and ethnicity are always confused, okay? Because if you were a Croat, you were Catholic. So you didn't even have to say you were Catholic. You just say, I'm a Croat, meaning you're a Catholic. Or you'd say, I'm Catholic, meaning you're a Croat. They couldn't see the difference. So the same, you know, if you're a Muslim, you're a Bosniak and vice versa. And if you're a Serb, you're Orthodox. Okay, so they did not make the distinction between religion and race or ethnicity the way we do in other countries. They were just kind of confused and jumbled. So the alleged message is Our Lady is supposed to have said, all religions are equal before my son. It is you on earth who create divisions. Okay. Now, when we hear a message like this, first of all, we have to understand there's that principle, the sound principle from St. Thomas Aquinas. He says, everything received is received according to the manner of the recipient. Okay. So if I explained to a crowd of people about quantum mechanics or astrophysics, they're all going to understand me according to their own language, vocabulary, and limitations, and their own experiences. And if they then were asked to repeat, what have you just learned, and repeated it, each one would repeat it in a way unique to him or her. Okay, so everything received is received according to the manner of the recipient. So if a visionary uses the word religion in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Really, religion means ethnicity for them. Certainly did at that time. So you know, all religions are equal before my son. We have to understand it as all ethnicities, all peoples. Because here the objection was, you know, how, how come a Serb Orthodox was cured? And of course, you know, you have to also under, uh, wonder why was a Franciscan puzzled by that, you know? Because of the, the I suppose, bad feeling, bad blood, uh, confusion among those people mutual, perhaps mistrust, I don't know, at that time, and then which was made worse by the war in those countries, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. <clears throat> and of course, all along, Our Lady was calling for peace between peoples. Okay, so here, this message, you know, all religions are equal, really means all peoples are equal before my son. Um, and that's true, all peoples, all people are called to salvation in Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Okay. There's another message I think that might be related to this, and I'm not even sure if this is authentic. It's usually raised by objectors to Medjugorje, and I've not been able to find the message in any body or collection of authentic messages from Medjugorje. And it's something like, God is sovereign over all religions or God rules over all religions. A quote like this. And again, I think we have to understand this, we have to understand it in context. You know, yeah, God is in charge of all religions, God is in charge of all peoples. That is clear. It doesn't mean that God has willed all religions, actively willed, you know, as though there are different ways to God. There's only one way to God. And when we look at a message like that, we have to look at the context of all the other messages. Is there even remotely a suggestion that the Catholic Church is unnecessary? Is there even remotely a suggestion in all the other messages that you could make your own way to God bypassing Christ and the Church and the sacraments? No, there is not. So it's really unfair to kind of twist one isolated thing out of context and make, make uh, a mountain out of a molehill or in, a mountain out of a non-existent molehill. I think that is deeply unfair because people who do that don't realize that their ancestors would have done it to Lourdes and Fatima. Okay, let's give an example. Let's try. I, I hate doing this, but I'm gonna, I need to do this to show them that they would easily, if they had been alive at that time, they would have easily done this to Lourdes and Fatima. Lourdes, Our Lady allegedly says, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now you can object. And the pastor at the time did object. How can she say she's the Immaculate Conception? That's an event. Okay? Uh, not a person. You know, what does she mean by that? That sounds like nonsense. You could twist it like that. And actually, 
as I said, the pastor did object and make those objections, precisely those objections. Now, to understand it, Our Lady is saying that whatever you mean by Immaculate Conception, that's me. I'm the one who received God's grace. I'm the recipient of God's lavish grace. So that's why she actually ident identifies herself with an event, uh, with the beginning of her life. Okay? I mean, it's maybe because we're so used to hearing this, we have to realize how strange it was to the people who heard it at that time. What if Our Lady had said, I am the glorious assumption? <laughs> you know, it's, it's as strange uh, as saying that. If Our Lady had said, I am the glorious assumption, well, what does that mean? You can twist anything out of context. Now, Fatima, there's more stuff you could twist. For example, in one of Our Lady's messages to Lucia, after the initial events, she said, I am holding back, or sometimes the message is given as, I alone am holding back the hand of God's wrath. Help me with your prayers and sacrifices. We have a quote from Pope Francis more recently where he said, Our Lady does not hold back the hand of God's wrath. So there you, you have a Pope speaking and it contradicts an alleged message from Our Lady. What do you believe? Is Fatima fake? Now, we have to under when the Pope spoke and he said, Our Lady does not hold back the hand of God's anger, he's right. Literally, she doesn't. She does not hold back. God literally does not have anger. And Neither does Our Lady literally hold back uh, his anger. Now, metaphorically, God does have anger. God's love will manifest uh, his, as justice sometimes. And that to us, with respect to us, we would call it anger, the righteous anger of God. God does punish out of love. And Our Lady holding back, or Our Lady alone holding back, God's anger is, is an image of Our Lady interceding for us. But it's not like, you know, God, even through His love, wants to punish the world, and Our Lady is trying to stop Him. <laughs> if Our Lady is interceding for us, she does so because God wills her to. From eternity, He has willed for her to, to intercede with Him to be our great auxiliatrix, our great helper. You know, she's the mediatrix of all graces. She, she is the one most intimately united with Christ in his redemption. And she is the great help of Christians. So you see how easy it would be to twist the words of Lourdes and Fatima against those apparitions. I mean, it's a, um, I think it's awful when people just take some things out of context, ignoring the rest of the body of the messages and, and making it into something that seemingly cannot be reconciled with the Catholic faith. I think that's dishonest, it's not fair, and um, it's also kind of counterproductive because that same technique can be used against them and against every other apparition. A serious objection is, what if Medjugorje is false? Are we putting our souls in danger by going there or listening to the messages of Medjugorje? This is something I think that is present in many people's minds. Because even if it's okay, it's unapproved and Holy Mother Church needs our going there as pilgrims to help her discern whether this is true or not, well, what if it's fake? Um, am I in any danger going to Medjugorje? Is it, is it a, am I putting my faith in danger by going there? Now to this, I want to give a quote from Archbishop André-Joseph André Léonard, the Archbishop of Brussels, and he was the former primate of Belgium. And he says, I quote, I know bishop friends whose rule of behavior is to say, look out, if we are open to the events of Medjugorje, we can perhaps encourage something that is not authentic. There exists a risk. I am more sensitive to the opposite risk and say, just the same, it is possible that heaven has spoken to people at that place 
and I do not wish to take the risk of a priori being closed to that grace. Two risks exist. The risk that we are being deceived in Medjugorje and the risk that we are bypassing a gift of grace. Until the judgment of the Church, between the two risks, I prefer to take the risk of being open rather than the risk of a priori being closed to the grace of God, which can be operating in this place. Accordingly, therefore, I take the position of openness and prudence. Notice what the Archbishop says, openness and prudence. Prudence is practical wisdom. So he's basically saying there are two risks in Medjugorje. There's the one risk, it could be fake. And although he doesn't fully spell it, spell it out, if it's fake, people are being deceived. And what are they being deceived into? Praying the rosary every day, going to Mass, go, uh, reading the Bible, fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, and going to confession at least once a month. They're deceived into living a sacramental life more fully. Really? If that's a deception, oh happy deception. Would that the whole world were deceived in this way? And of course the other risk he's saying is that it could be a grace from God. And that there's a greater gr risk, it's a greater danger to be closed a priori to the grace of God. To say, well, no, nope, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. But if it is from God, we're, we're risking bypassing God's grace. And I, I think to this I'd also want to add some Dominican wisdom. You know, my brothers, when I first started going there as a priest with the laity, <coughs> they asked me a few questions about Medjugorje. How do people behave at Mass and adoration? What are confessions like in Medjugorje? And, and the behavior of priests in general in Medjugorje. And when they, I answered these questions, they said, clearly God's grace is at work in this place. We must cooperate with this. I remember I was at adoration. In, adoration in the evenings, in the summer, is at the back of church, and there's seating for seven and a half thousand people. So roughly I'd calculate there were about 10,000 people kneeling down in silence, adoring our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, in the Monstrance. And there was an African priest next to me, and he looked out, because you see the priests are sitting on one side in the sanctuary, and the people are all down there on the other side. Um, and he looked at the crowds of people and he said, now I know Medjugorje is real, when he saw how people were adoring our Lord, and you know, 10,000 people in silence adoring Jesus. I don't think you can fake that. You can't fake that. And you have to have your eyes open to see God's grace at work, where he chooses to work. It's not for us to decide whether the apparitions are true or not. Holy Mother Church will tell us when she's good and ready. But in the meantime, we're not blind. We can see God's grace is at work here. All the conversions taking place, so many conversions. I've heard some people kind of minimize it and say, oh yeah, people go to Medjugorje and have a little kind of pick-me-up. I think you have to be willfully blind to say that. You know, there are authentic conversions taking place. People's lives are transformed. People are turning back to Christ. If we can see God's grace is at work there, then we have to say, well, we have to cooperate with God's grace and be open to it.